Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the first day of Foundations, Contextual Dis Dimensions, and Practice of Addic Addiction Medicine in Adolescent through tra Transitional Age Youth Education and Medical Necessity. I am Liz Philman, and I serve as the Assistant Director for the Virginia Tech Richmond Center, and we are delighted to be providing the virtual conference management and technical support today. At this time, I'll cover just a few housekeeping items. This is a Zoom meeting, so we encourage you to leave your camera on, but be sure to remain muted unless invited to ask a question. We do invite you to interact with fellow participants and the instructor utilizing the chat. We will have Q&A throughout the session today, so please add your questions to the chat or raise your hand throughout the training, and Dr. Fishman will address as many as possible. Additionally, if you should have technical issues, my colleagues Elaine Densley, and Lisa Rowland are here to assist. Look for their names that have the VT at the end and send them a private message in the chat as needed. We do have a busy two hours today, so feel free to get up and stretch as needed, refill that coffee, but know that we have planned a 10 minute break. Dr. Fishman's presentation was shared with you in the know before you go you received yesterday as well as this morning. If you did not receive it, please reach out to one of the VT representatives to let us know. CMEs are, be given, are being given for this training, so please be sure to rename yourself to include your first and last name. This will allow us to track attendance easier and ensure everyone receives the correct number of CMEs. This can be done by right-clicking on your name on the screen and selecting rename. Everyone will also be required to complete an evaluation for each day. Those will be provided at, end, at the end of each day and at the end of the two sessions via email. Thanks again for joining us today. And now I'd like to introduce Nina Marino, Director of the Office of Child and Family Services at the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services to offer a welcome. Welcome, Nina. Mm. Director of the Office of Child and Family Services here at the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. I wanted to welcome you all to our training, the um, American Society for Addiction Medicine, or ASAM for short, our adolescent specific training that is sponsored by our office. We're really excited to welcome you to this two day training and overview of how the ASAM criteria can be applied in the clinical management of problem substance use for adolescents. I would also like to take a brief moment to thank a couple people. First, I'd like to thank Janet Amobisa and Mia McCoy at DBHDS for coordinating and planning this training, along with our partners at Virginia Tech, who are really the ones responsible for this event happening. We know how critical it is that we provide adolescent-specific substance use trainings to prescribing providers, clinicians, and other behavioral health professionals who are working with young people and their families. And we hope that this two-day training will expand your comfort in screening, assessment, family engagement, and understanding the specific contextual factors related to adolescent development and substance use, as well as matching treatment criteria based on the ASAM levels of care. The goals of DBHDS and the Office of Child and Family Services is to enhance and expand the adolescent system of care for substance use and co-occurring disorders across the state. And in the fall of 2022, we completed our first ever statewide needs assessment to identify gaps, barriers, and opportunities specific to substance use treatment and recovery services. And we were specifically looking at what developmentally and culturally specific services were needed and appropriate for youth ages 12 to 18, as well as transition age youth up to the age of 21. And what we learned confirmed what we had been hearing anecdotally for quite some time which is the service continuum for substance use treatment is sparse and inconsistent, especially at the higher levels of care, which are often non-existent in, existent in many parts of the state. And we learned this from both providers and caregivers, and we were able to identify our highest priority areas. And so now we're launching a new phase of work around strategic planning, which would um, include funding specific initiatives in targeted areas across the state. So to that end, we're concentrating our funding and efforts in a couple of key areas to expand our current system of care. Those include evidence-based workforce development for prescribers and behavioral health professionals, clinical supervision for behavioral health professionals around integrating substance use treatment into traditional mental health settings, and targeted technical assistance around medications for opioid use disorders with prescribers. 
We're also providing regional startup funding for intensive outpatient, partial hospitalization, or residential programming, as well as state and regional capacity building and strategic planning that we hope will inform future funding priorities in our office. As well, we launched the Screening Brief Intervention and Referral to Treatment, or ESPERT as we call it, grant in the fall of 2021. ESPERT is an evidence-based model of care for early detection and intervention of problem substance use and co-occurring mental health issues. This program aligns with the goals that we have in our office to expand earlier intervention and upstream models of care that are evidence-based with the intention of continuing to bring integrated behavioral health care into primary care settings. We partnered with the University of Baltimore and trusted doctors in Northern Virginia to date. And as of now, we have over 4,300 youth who've been screened and close to 300 youth who've been referred for specialized treatment. And we now have four full-time clinicians embedded in primary care settings in Northern Virginia to manage the brief treatment and care coordination. These numbers have surpassed the expectations of the project team and of SAMHSA at the federal level who has provided this funding to us, which has positioned the Virginia ESPERT project as a champion ESPERT site in the country. We will be launching a similar model in the Tidewater area later this year to bring ESPERT to a pediatric ED setting, as well as goals in the future of expanding to rural practice sites. So with that, we hope that you find this program to be built, fulfilling and that it expands your comfort and knowledge around treatment options for youth with problem substance use or a substance use use disorder. We thank you for your efforts and dedication to the youth in our state. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce you to our training and facilitator over the next two days. Dr. Mark Fishman is a board certified in addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine. He's a member of the psychiatry faculty at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, uh, the medical director of Maryland Treatment Centers, as well as a senior research assistant with Friends Research, research Institute, a Maryland-based social science research evaluation and consulting firm which promotes health and well-being through research, grants administration, education, and treatment. His clinical specialties include treatment of drug involved in dual diagnosis adolescence, opioid dependence in adolescents and adults, and addiction with comorbid pain. His research work is focused on models of care and treatment outcomes in adolescent addictions, in particular opioid dependence. Dr. Fishman served as the co-editor for the most recent edition of the ASAMS Patient Placement Criteria and served as the chief editor for the ASAM supplement on pharma pharmacotherapies for alcohol use disorders. He is the chair of the treatment criteria committee, committee for ASAM. And with that, I just wanted to again, thank you for joining us and we really hope you enjoy the next two days. All right, am I up? You look up to me. All right. Well, let me share my screen. Good morning, everyone. And thanks for coming. It's a treat to be here. And um, I'm going to talk today, as you heard, about using the ASAM criteria as a lens into fundamentals for treatment planning and treatment for youth, adolescents, and young adults. And then in particular, some of the granular elements of how to use it for placement levels of care. And so we'll go through a, a bunch of case scenarios uh, next time, tomorrow uh, when we meet. Today, we'll talk more about general principles. Uh, we'll pause periodically for questions, which we can take through uh, unmuting or through the chat. Just briefly, here are some disclosures. Um, I think that they don't bias me, but I, I wanna be transparent and you guys be the judge. And here's how we're gonna manage the time together. Uh, very briefly talk about the basics of the ASAM criteria, but I assume most of you know the fundamental outlines. And then spend some time going through each of the six ASAM assessment dimensions as a lens or a roadmap to think about the fundamentals of youth treatment, thinking about how to think about uh, intoxication and withdrawal, how to think about yeah. biomedical comorbidities, think about in particular 
motivation and engagement, going through each of the uh, assessment dimensions and um, thinking about them in that systematic way, and then bringing it together with a in-depth case illustration about placement, treatment planning, and alternative scenarios. And as I say, hopefully, even though it's a large group, get a chance to do some Q&A and hear about your concerns and questions and the like. Just briefly about me, uh, as you heard, I'm a shrink by training. Hope you won't hold that against me, but um, I spend most of my time working in addiction medicine, addiction psychiatry, where three hats mostly. My favorite is as a direct provider of clinical care, taking care of uh, patients across the lifespan. I have a special fondness for youth. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here. Uh, working with uh, teenagers and young adults and their families. I, I do work in program administration, so developing programs in Central Maryland, trying to leverage my personal efforts to be able to reach more folks in a public sector community treatment program. And then lastly, doing research and teaching. And my research focus, as you heard, has been uh, opioid use disorders recently, thinking about models of care <clears throat> in reaching young adults in particular, but also adolescents who have problems with opioid addiction and how to expand the footprint of access to care with more developmentally specific approaches. And one of the things I'll touch on uh, in that vein is my thoughts about the imperative that I think we have as a field and we don't do a good enough job in, in terms of engaging families as a way of improving uh, our touch and our engagement and our effectiveness for treating youth. And we'll spend a bunch of time in dimension six for the ASAM criteria, that is recovery environment, so important for young people. Here are the six ASAM assessment dimensions. I assume these are relatively old hat, but just to throw them up on the board, uh, one through six, um, not necessarily in order of importance. And you'll see that when we get into the dimension by dimension fundamentals part uh, of the discussion, I'm gonna throw them out of order a little bit and start with four instead of one. Uh, but here they are, intoxication withdrawal. Uh, is there acute intoxication? Is the person in their right mind, are they in danger from impending withdrawal or from consequences of intoxication? And that's why presumably it's number one, because if you're in an emergency setting, an emergency department or a triage setting, the things that are immediately life-threatening and actionable that you have to sort out first and foremost, right, are, are number one, intoxication withdrawal. Number two, biomedical conditions, uh, whether those are pre-occurring or subsequent to the uh, consequences of substance use, but either way, they are co-occurring and comorbid. Here's a big one for youth, number three. Um, this is the dual diagnosis or multi-diagnosis or co-occurring condition assessment, emotional, behavioral, cognitive conditions, so prevalent in young people, whether or not they have a diagnosed psychiatric or mental health comorbid condition, you know they have symptoms. And part of, as we'll discuss, a big imperative here is to get them assessed and to make progress and to think about, well, what's going on here and how do I incorporate this into my thinking about a comprehensive treatment plan? Readiness to change. And if I had to put my money on which of these is the most important of these six, not that anybody's requiring uh, a contest or a horse race in that way, uh, I'd put my money here because alliance and connection and engagement is where it all begins. And uh, that's where I think we need to learn, and maybe you guys are old pros at this, but where we need to learn to focus our efforts in terms of connecting with young people and their families before we expect them uh, to get ready to change, to prepare to change, to act on change. Uh, we've got to work on their readiness and their motivation um, intrinsic and extrinsic, and we'll talk more about that. Relapse, continued use, continued problem potential, what's the likelihood and the imminent dangerousness and risk of return or continuation of use and other comorbid problems, and then recovery environment, including family, including uh, home situation, including supports, etc. Here are the uh, ASAM 
levels of care, just the taxonomy of dividing up how different settings go. And remember, level of care or setting is just where the treatment happens. And there is some correlation with intensity and with services and resources. But before you jump to placement, it's more important to think about what are the components of a treatment plan. And then once you've decided, well, what does this young person need? Then it's, well, where can I do it in this catalog of um, um, levels of care? And of course, not all levels of care will be available in every community, in every state, in every region. So one of the things we learn to do is to improvise and to make do and to make jerry-rigged solutions to the puzzles that lack of resources unfortunately present, especially uh, in the public sector and in under-resourced populations. Here's a cartoon or a simplified chart of the grid of how we put the assessment dimensions and the levels of care together, looking at the assessment dimensions uh, in red along the left, one through six, and the levels of care in their broad categories one through four in blue across the top and try to link the severity and the need of each individual after an assessment with what kind of setting would most likely suit that person and then putting it all together an integrated whole how to get the most bang for your effort uh, in a place that is available a nod to the practical reality of logistics and then proceeding with the implementation in a particular level of care. So you guys know all that, but that by way of background. And now what I want to do is um, an extended uh, sojourn. And this will take, I think, um, at least the rest of today, and maybe the beginning of tomorrow, one by one, the six dimensions, using them as a guide to the fundamentals of what are the core issues from assessment to treatment planning to treatment implementation in youth SUD and comorbid condition treatment, thinking about the ASAM criteria and its structure as a framework, as a platform, as a series of footholds and handholds to kind of climb this difficult mountain of a way of thinking about how to approach a young person. Of course, when we get to actually thinking about placement, there's also the practical element of how to use this organization of assessment dimensions one through six as a way of communicating a treatment plan. Here's my dimension one plan, here's my dimension two plan, here's my dimension three plan. And of course, that also translates into how to convey that information to a payer in a utilization, utilization management situation. I wanna get authorization. I wanna get approval for a particular level of care, for a particular treatment plan. And this has very critical relevance to clinical supervision, to the mechanics of uh, getting treatment authorized and paid for, and then the mechanics of uh, being able to track outcomes uh, according to levels of care. So a structure, not that this is the only structure, not that there couldn't be alternates, not that six dimensions is somehow God-given, could there be five, could there be seven? Yes, of course they could, but this is a very um, consensus-driven, evidence-based version uh, that I think takes its place um, in this country and internationally, actually, as the, the generally accepted standard of care. Will it change over time? You betcha. And in fact, uh, ASAM is currently now uh, working on the third edition. And so a year from now, we'll probably have that out and each state will adopt it into regulation. And just when you thought you were expert enough at the third edition, well, I'm so I apologize. They'll hit you with a new organization. OK, so but that's because we learn as we go. That's because people who are cogitating and puzzling on these things, hopefully come up with better ideas. So stay tuned for that. But this is what we got as we got it.
Now I'm gonna start with dimension four rather than dimension one, as I mentioned, because I think this is where the action is at the beginning. And unless you're working in an emergency department and you've got you know, five minutes to figure out whether the person has a knife in their forehead or they're about to go into withdrawal or they've got a, an overdose and you have to act quickly in a triage kind of way, what you're doing for most of your initial encounter, of course, you got to get the questions asked, you got to do the assessment, you, you got to check the boxes, but we're focused on this concept of motivation and engagement, building therapeutic alliance and drawing the person in or the family in to try to think about how we can form a, a connection to move forward, right? Because they don't come to you uh, ready for action, right? You know that. Uh, we think in our encounters with any patient with SUD and with young people in particular, that abstinence is going to improve their lives, that we are concerned with impairments in function and improvements in function that we are committed to long-term solutions. They've got their lives ahead of us and we're thinking long-term in a way that is adult style thinking, not immediate gratification, what's right in front of my nose, youth style thinking. And we're committed to the rubric of recovery, recovery from substance use disorders, recovery from other mental health disorders, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not what's on this young person's mind, and it might not be what's on the family's mind, right? They want crisis relief. They're usually at your door in your office because there's some crisis, not because they've had some epiphany and a bolt of lightning and the scales have fallen from their eyes and they've looked you up and said, I've finally figured out that my cannabis use is unmanageable. I must have a cannabis use disorder. I looked it up and I meet seven of the 12 criteria. Can you help me with it? Uh, obviously that's not what's going on. They're dragged in by the scruff of their neck by some adult in some crisis. They'd love to have better drugs. Wait, did I come in the wrong office? I thought I was at the bud tender, at the dispensary. Can't you give me better weed, cheaper weed, legal weed? That's what they'd like, right? Uh, and they want to get out of trouble. And they want to get some meddling adult who, in their view, has no idea what they're talking about. They want to get that person off their back. And that's what they'd hope you would help them with. So we're going to be thinking about, no, we're obviously not providing better, stronger, cheaper, freer weed. But the idea is that by linking using your standard kind of MET, MI lens, we're gonna to try to link to meet them where they are and think about how we can think about their status in dimension four and try to connect the dots. That's a very common theme here. How do you connect the dots? What's their crisis? What's their motivation? And how do we gradually move them along towards the goals that we think are important in terms of improving function? Part of that is figuring out why are they here? And we want our version, we want their version, we want their family's version, we want the referral agency's version. Who's that? That might be the school, that might be juvenile justice, that might be a community provider, that might be a pediatrician, whatever it is. But why now? What got them to the end of the rope? Why, why are they here? Why does some adult drag them in by the scruff of their neck? And how can we use that? Those of you who are familiar with adult treatment for people who are veterans of the system will be used to hearing things. This is not what kids say, but you'll hear adults say, why'd you come to treatment? And they'll say, oh, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired, you know, to quote a kind of somewhat empty jargon. Um, and so, yeah, right. Well, you were miserable, but why now? Why not last week? Why not next week? So one of the things we do there is to try to say, what's the straw that broke the camel's back? Now with kids who have very low self-recognition of impairment, there may be no camel's back that a straw breaks, but there's still some kind of latest pressing 
thing that got them in the door. And whatever that is, we want to identify that because we may need to come push that button again because motivation is waxing and waning. And we want to be able to identify that and say, well, that's what got you in the door. Let's come back to thinking about why that's important. And we don't expect them to jump into treatment, right? We got to focus on treatment readiness. We got to focus on meeting them where they are. We think of recovery, but they're not ready for capital R recovery at first, right? They've got to discover, it's discovery rather than recovery. What is this all about? What are we asking them to accomplish in small incremental bits? And most young people are not looking to go to rehab, right? We're focused on what we sometimes joke is prehab. That is, what are the elements that might prepare them to be getting ready eventually for action phase. And you guys know the stages of change. This is uh, the work of Prochaska and DiClemente, obviously. And they don't show up here in action phase, right? They show up in pre-contemplation or more likely pre-pre-pre-pre-contemplation. And our job is to move them using motivational enhancement or motivational interviewing incrementally and gradually along the way. And it would be setting ourselves up for failure to expect them to be ready to do something to change on day one, to be motivated to want to quit using drugs, cannabis. Oh yeah, I forgot cannabis isn't a drug, but even cutting down is not gonna be in their scenario at first. And that's to be expected. That's not a failure of our interaction, that's an assumption, and it's up to us to do the work of moving them along, not to blame them for being knuckleheads because they don't get it. Don't get me wrong, maybe some of them are knuckleheads, but that is not gonna motivate them by us just telling them, you're wrong, you don't get it, I'm right, right? So how can we talk to them uh, about making that journey with us? Everybody's got to find their own language. Uh, everybody um, has got to find the right words that work with their own style and their own voice. Each individual kid and each individual kid's family is different. But I want to walk through with you some approaches that I use, that others use, just to give you some examples. And you might try them on for size. This takes practice. This takes trying stuff. You strike out more than you get hits but you keep trying. And the first point is, to use a tired sports metaphor, is it's not up the middle. It's not lecturing, it's not confrontation, right? It's kind of end around, it's a bit of a dance. And the first thing is just telling them that it's obvious and they're wrong and that I'm the expert, why don't you just listen to what I say is obviously not going to be helpful. So part of the idea is detoxifying and getting into a conversation that is going to be slower than you'd like, that is not going to get where you want to go right away. But this circuitous longitudinal approach is likely to be more effective. So the first thing that I like to do is say, so what I've heard you say, you know, is to say back to them is that you don't have a problem. It's no big deal. You're not in any trouble, uh, whatever trouble you might be in or whatever crisis you might have, you don't think is related to your substance use, your drinking, your cannabis use. Okay. I hear that. And I'm glad that you've explained to me your thinking on the matter and we can agree to disagree. So I say that a lot. We're going to agree to disagree. That's fine. So Let's not talk necessarily about your problem, but let's see, can you tell me about someone else who may have a problem? Your cousin, your, old, your friend's older brother, somebody else you met at school, uh, some kid down the street, whatever, who has been in trouble, who does smoke too much. You don't think that it's a problem for you, you don't think it's too much for you, but who do you know who it might be? a problem for. And what that gets us to is maybe we're not on the same page, but maybe we're in the same book, at least kind of agreeing that there is such a thing, that there is a beast of a young person 
who smokes too much. There is a beast, somebody who's been in trouble from their substance use. And let's talk about the characteristics of that. Why is it too much? How did they get into trouble? What is the problem? How much is too much? And now at least we're having a dialogue about this and we've removed the defensiveness, the toxicity about I'm blaming you. No, this is about some other kid. This is Charlie, this is Susie, whatever. And you know, a bunch of grownups, including me, old graybeard, don't know what I'm talking about, are telling you that maybe you are using too much. And I know you don't agree with that and that's fine. But why would we say a dumb thing like that? Your coach, your teacher, your doctor, your parents. Why are they saying that? You don't have to agree, but can you at least describe it? And what that does is that is a very important developmental task, a difficult task for adolescents, but an important developmental task of helping them adopt somebody else's perspective. Walk, maybe not a mile, but walk 10 feet in somebody else's shoes. Can you at least articulate some of the message that you're getting about the rationale for impairment? You don't have to buy it. Let's just articulate it and put it on the table. And of course, you do the pros and cons. What are the pros of using, the cons of using? We always lead with the pros. Why? Not because we're in favor of it, but because People use because it's fun. People get high because they enjoy it. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. You got to acknowledge that. You get credibility points for that. What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? Oh, there are no cons. Well, all right. But let's talk about the pros. Let's talk about the limits of the pros. And let's talk about the what ifs on the cons. What would make cons for you if they could be? Oh, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, fine. There's nothing wrong with it now. But Let's just speculate. What would be the evidence in your view in some future alternate metaverse that it could be a problem? Like how much would be too much for you? And let's talk about your current use pattern. You say you only smoke on the weekends. So you think that maybe smoking during the weekdays, maybe that would be the line that would make the definition of too much, or you only smoke after school, after you do your homework, maybe before your homework, that would be too much. Or maybe if you were smoking during the day or before school, that would be too much. But I'd be interested in hearing your view on this. And once again, maybe now we're not on the same page, but maybe we're beyond being on the same book, maybe or even to the first, to the same chapter. Where's the line if there is a line that you think it would be a problem for you to cross. And you can see what we're doing is setting it up for the future, for a longitudinal discussion, because we're not gonna solve this today, but you know, uh, you come back next week or you come back next month or you come back tomorrow when we're continuing to talk about it and you say, ah, you told me that smoking on the weekdays uh, might be a problem or smoking uh, during the school day in the bathroom at school might be a problem. And now you tell me you're doing that. What do you think about, oh, I changed my mind. It's okay, it's fine. All right. But now what we've done is in a longitudinal way, set up a series of lines that a person said they might never cross. And that's part of what the course of addictive illness is, right? Crossing a series of lines that you thought you'd never cross. and rather than describing that as a chapter from a textbook, you hold it up as the mirror of the pageant of their own life. You know, you cross this line, you cross this line, you cross this line. Huh, what do you make of that? Well, you say you could stop any time and it's no big deal, but you haven't. Well, what do you, what do you think? W would you try? Would you cut down? How about, how about quitting for two weeks? We call this sampling abstinence. Uh, what about cutting down for a, a month? Um, it's not going anywhere, right? You can always come back to it. There's plenty of weed in the world. Let's see what it's like. Come back. We'll compare notes. Maybe you'll hate it. Maybe you'll love it. Maybe you'll learn something. And one of the things that they're likely to learn is that it's not as trivial as they think, right? It's actually pretty hard to quit. And well, I see when they come back, you say, well, uh huh, you didn't really cut down or quit. Why was that? Was it harder? Huh? 
harder than you thought. And then you can explain to them that there is such a thing as cannabis withdrawal. Now, remember, cannabis withdrawal is not dangerous. Nobody ever died of it. It's not terrible. And uh, you don't need to be in the hospital. It's not like alcohol withdrawal and benzo withdrawal and opioid withdrawal, but it is a thing. And one of the things that you want to explain to people is, oh, you had trouble sleeping or you got more grouchy or you noticed that you were hot and cold. Hmm. I wonder if it's got its claws into you more than you thought. And can we talk about that? Anyway, the most important thing, though, is that you've established the conversation, that you've tried to make a connection, that they've been honest with you and you've tried to be honest with them. And it's important to explicitly reinforce that. Thank you so much for talking with me. I appreciate your transparency, your bravery. Um, I, I'm so glad you told me the truth. I want to hear how you think. Right? I don't want them to say, okay, Dr. Fishman, I promise I'll never smoke weed again. Right? That's baloney. I don't want to hear that. It doesn't help me. I want them to push back. I want to have the conversation. So come on back and let's continue this conversation. And then this is a longitudinal kind of conversation where you hope to make some incremental progress, but it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? And here, here's some other kinds of pieces of the conversation that can sometimes help. Well, you don't think you're having trouble, but can you think of things that you may have ever done that you regretted the next day, the next week, that you did while you were high. Yeah, sure, I've done all sorts of embarrassing things in my life, but it had nothing to do with drinking or smoking. What are you, an idiot? Okay, maybe not, but just think about that, you know, and have you seen other people who've done things that they regret? And you know, you're around other people who smoke cannabis or drink or use other substances. And do you notice that they're more likely to be in trouble than the average person in the choir at church? Why is that? Are those the people you want to be hanging out with? Are they good for you? Are they getting you what you want? You can sometimes get a young person to be interested in the metaphor um, of the biology 101 theory of addiction, right? That teen brains are easily bruised, uh, that substances of misuse are sledgehammers that hijack the brain's natural reward system. If you keep pushing that button, the pathway gets stronger, you're reinforcing it, it becomes the thing that the mouse in the maze looking for the cheese keeps running after. Some kids would be interested in that. Other kids, their eyes will glaze over and it won't make any difference, but at least it's on the menu. Yeah, listen, I'm not trying to fuss at you that nobody should ever use any intoxicants, drinking, smoking, cannabis, whatever. Maybe a little is okay, sure, but is what you're doing a little? Let's talk about you know, relative proportions here. Doesn't sound like a little to me. Well, and I'm not necessarily saying that it's never okay for no one know how, but maybe it's not right for you now. And then that's an opportunity once you've learned about what they're into, what their goals are, what they're thinking about. Listen, I've learned from you and it's so cool to hear that you're interested in X, Y, Z, grades, sports, family, girlfriend, boyfriend, music, you know, whatever it is. How is it that cannabis is or is not compatible with that? And maybe it's a problem for you now. I'm not talking about forever. They get the idea that you're making some moral condemnation of ever having a good time. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying maybe this way of having a good time for now. And now can mean the next five minutes, the next week, the next month. You know, it's not forever. Well, yes, you could be the special rare exception. You, you're invincible, like all teenagers are invincible. But why gamble? Seems like odds in Vegas are not with you. And then this one's tough because it's an abstraction that's maybe difficult for many adolescents, but it's worth trying. Listen, if getting high is so good, so fun, so motivating, so important, that my advice, your mom's advice, your teacher's advice, your girlfriend, boyfriend's advice, you know, whatever other people have said, if it all means nothing to you compared to how important weed is, does that tell you something? I mean, maybe 
maybe it's more important to you proportionally than is good for you or that you're acknowledging. What do you make of that? Now you can see that that's a complicated abstraction. Maybe it won't fly, but should try it out. And what I'm asking you to do in dimension four, in, in the words of you know, the cartoonist Gary Larson from the far side, is to be selling refrigerators to Eskimos. It's not trivial, but we are used car salesmen for this message. And part of the skill set is learning to be sincere, but learning to be slick but learning to be sincere, but learning to connect and figuring out a way of trying to find a voice that will build an alliance over this material with the person in front of you. Okay, any comments, questions, discussion points around dimension one, I mean about dimension four before we go to the next one? Does that all make sense? My if guess is have, this is the stuff that you guys do intuitively. If you have a question for Dr. Fishman, you can use your reaction. Um, you have a reaction thing at the bottom. And if you click on it, you can raise your hand. Um, Dr. You'll go right to the top of the list and Dr. Fishman will answer your question. All right, hearing none, let's press on. Dimension one, so back into order now. And this is intoxication withdrawal potential. And this won't be as prominent in young people as it might be in older adults. They haven't been using as long, typically, to have the same degree of dimension one problems. But that's not universally true. As I said, cannabis has a withdrawal system. It's since symptoms. It's not dangerous or deadly, but it is motivating and it keeps people going. There are certainly far too many youth who are using opioids at physiological dependence levels and do have opioid withdrawal. So it is for real. Um, and just some examples of these dimension one considerations that are sometimes typical of young people as opposed to older people. You're not going to see morning shakes with alcohol withdrawal or delirium tremens from alcohol withdrawal, right? That takes decades to develop a handle a day of vodka habit, but we will see cannabis withdrawal with insomnia and irritability. We talked about that. Cannabis intoxication with, um, and that's not just from smoking today, that could be chronic use over lingering for weeks, even after stopping with short-term memory, language and thinking problems and difficulties in communicating and abstract thinking. Opioid withdrawal for sure, which has a physical sickness that's quite severe with severe cravings. And it's one of the prime motivators for relief of withdrawal that people keep using once they get fully physiological dependent. It won't be the majority of young people, but it will be a very sick and substantial minority that need high intensity services. Again, benzo withdrawal will not be common. Most of the youngsters who are using street Xanax are not doing every day developing full physiological dependence, but you will sometimes see it. Any intoxication can cause agitation. They're not in their right mind, they're belligerent uh, and they're uh, emotionally dysregulated. Uh, you can sometimes see cannabis induced psychosis. Uh, and this will be sometimes indistinguishable from the presentation of other psychotic psychiatric illnesses like schizophrenia. I don't know if you guys see much in the way of inhalants. This is a thing that comes and goes. It's particularly uh, notable in younger adolescents who may not be able to uh, afford or be in the drug trade for the more sophisticated or good stuff that their older brothers and sisters have. So they go shopping in their parents' um, utility closets under the sink and they're huffing spray paint or uh, other kinds of industrial solvents. Uh, that's super bad for your brain and it causes both an acute intoxication and a sometimes persistent uh, disorganization of thinking that we call delirium. 
if adolescents are using stimulants frequently, whether that's cocaine or methamphetamine or prescription stimulants, that is misusing and overusing Adderall or Ritalin or the like, uh, when they're in withdrawal, they can be severely depressed and have severe craving. In intoxication, they can be agitated and or psychotic. And hallucinogens are never went away, but they're making a comeback. And so these days, just like cannabis and in the previous opioid crisis, um, my field, the medical profession, isn't helping you any. So psychedelics are in the news and they're medicine and they're good for what ails you. And so why shouldn't we be dosing LSD and mushrooms and ketamine and all that good stuff at home? If doctors are prescribing it, it must be fine. And so as that increases, you will see more of the psychiatric consequences of intoxication and lingering flashbacks, what we call persisting perceptual distortion syndromes, where perception and reality um, uh, are distorted during intoxication. And then even with periods of recurrence post-intoxication, so those are just some examples. Um, although young people won't usually need specific treatment services for withdrawal, for example, with cannabis or alcohol or nicotine, they might for opioids, they might for benzos. And when it's for opioids or benzos, there's a medical element to that withdrawal management or detoxification. Uh, and that usually goes best in a controlled environment, in a bed-based care, but it doesn't have to be. It can be done in an ambulatory way, but that hasn't been as well studied. We don't really know the outcomes for ambulatory detox in adolescents, although young adults certainly get it in adult programs. Alcohol withdrawal, again, will be uncommon in young people. Not never, but, but uncommon. And with all substances, although it isn't life-threatening or dangerous, withdrawal often includes severe sleep disturbance. And it's important to pay attention to that, both as an element of therapeutic alliance. I know what you're experiencing. It must stink to not be able to sleep. That's a big lapse or use trigger. But it also turns out that it's one of the few things that we can make a lot of progress with medically helpful today. So I may not be able to treat your depression or your psychosis and resolve it the same day, you know, as when we get into dimension three and talk about um, co-occurring psychiatric disorders, you know, major depression, we start people on antidepressants or start people on antidepressant psychotherapy, that takes weeks, maybe months to be effective. That's very frustrating. But I can help you medically with sleep aids right away. And that is a big kind of motivational credibility gap uh, bridger. Uh, I can help you sleep today. I can give you non-addictive sleep aids. Uh, over-the-counter stuff like melatonin or even Benadryl or prescription stuff like a trazodone or doxepin. And again, these insomnia syndromes with withdrawal are not life-threatening, but boy, they stink and it can be helpful to pay attention. Even just knowing about it helps give people a, a roadmap. And for all substances, just the discontinuation of an ingrained habit is a big deal. Remember, People who are using a lot, it's what they do. Their lives are organized around the principle of getting substances, using substances, connecting with people who use substances, getting over the aftermath, hangover, withdrawal, getting out of trouble of using substances, and other parts of their lives gradually diminish in proportion in relationship to their attention to substances. And so making that an explicit focus, just the changing of habit. And although this isn't traditionally thought of as detoxification, I want you to think of it as an important part of withdrawal management. And it's not just what not to do, it's what to do as an alternative. And that's an important principle. We're not just saying don't use we're saying, do these other things instead. Now, each person may have other things. What are the activities that you've given up, et cetera? But 
giving people a prescription for breaking the habit and spending a focus and attention on that behavioral change pathway is important. Now, when we talk about actual detox services like for opioid withdrawal, and this is certainly true of adult services, but for those subset of young people, young adults, especially more than adolescents, but some adolescents who are using opioids, they may go into detox services. And we sometimes think of detox as a revolving door, and that's very frustrating. And remember, although detox may be a necessary feature of the treatment service delivery cascade, it is never a sufficient element. Detox alone does not get people to quit. Relapse post-detox, say with opioids, is nearly universal. I won't say 100%, but 80, 90% within 30 days of detox, people relapse. So detox may be an opening, but it is not itself a sufficient course of treatment. It needs to be linked to somewhere for continuing care. And as we'll talk about in Dimension 5 for relapse prevention, one of the great tools that we have for opioids is getting people onto MAT, medication-assisted treatment, or MOUD, medications for opioid use disorder. And that applies to adolescents and young adults as well. So stay tuned for that when we talk about Dimension 5. All right. Not as much material on dimension one because it isn't as much a focus for uh, adolescents and young adults, but it's important nevertheless. Quick pause for questions, comments, discussion around service delivery and assessment elements in dimension one. Yes, uh, Dr. Fishman, I have a question in regarding um, the timeline, I mean, the, the timing. Uh, yeah. Access one with onset of substance use, uh, frequency, all those factors is the time. Last week, last two months, last month, last 30 days. What's- um, For the, what, for withdrawal? For withdrawal and for intoxication. When sure. You're doing, when you're doing the evaluation first time. Sure, that that's a great out. question. Well, it's about different timelines for different substances. So important to know what substances will likely produce what effects when, both in relationship to recent use, chronic use, and recent cessation for withdrawal. So the first thing is, is there something not right about this person that you're wondering whether they're having intoxication or withdrawal? They're goofy, they're not thinking right, they're slurring their speech, they're jittery, they're talking about being uncomfortable, uh, they have abnormal vital signs, they're wiggly. And when you see those things, then you're asking about, what did you use? When did you use it? When did you stop? So just to talk about some of those things, uh, opioid intoxication will typically last hours, not days. Opioid withdrawal, especially in the era of fentanyl, will usually come on 12 to 24 hours after last use and will tend to last about a week. We used to think of the peak of heroin withdrawal as being on day two or three following stopping heroin. But fentanyl is stored in fat tissues and lingers a long time. And so there's a elongation shift now to the opioid withdrawal system, sim opioid withdrawal symptoms, such that peak might be day four or day five with it lasting longer. Stimulant withdrawal typically peaks at 12 to 24 hours after stopping, and intoxication, depending on whether it's a long-acting stimulant or a short-acting stimulant, is typically 6 to 12 hours. But the psychosis that might be induced by either stimulants or by cannabis, although most people resolve after intoxication resolves, a not insignificant subgroup of people persist with agitation and psychosis for days to weeks, and in some rare cases, tragically, even indefinitely. Is that, is that helpful? Are there other things in particular you wanted to know about time course? Absolutely, that's a lot helpful. Um, yeah, totally, because when you're doing the assessment initially, you try to figure out how, how severe is the situation so the child can get the service that they need. Yes. And, 
and um, past history, for example, six months or four months ago, versus the recent use. It's, the it's kind more of about recency. That's right. For intoxication withdrawal, we're less concerned about four months ago than we are about this week. And remember, even if a person is not in withdrawal now, they're still intoxicated or they're just coming out of their intoxication state, then you got to think about what is the likely time course if they've been using regularly for withdrawal in the next hours and days. Yes, and the last point is um, nowadays, after the conference that I came recently, Katka, um, upon DEA is indicating that a lot of the substances are being mixed now with fentanyl, like marijuana with fentanyl, cocaine with fentanyl, methamphetamine with fentanyl. So these symptoms may overlap in terms of one substance and the other. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So let me accentuate that uh, because I'm very glad you raised that. Increasingly, you all know that opioids on the street are no longer prescription opioids as they were five years ago. And in fact, aren't even heroin anymore. Um, in your region, in my region, it's mostly either laced and mixed with fentanyl or is entirely fentanyl. And when the kids say they're using Perks, Perk 30s, Percocets, whatever, mostly what they're really using is fentanyl pressed into counterfeit pills that look like Percocet, but really aren't, are really fentanyl. And also, they, the gangsters and the drug trade use the same kinds of pill pressing counterfeit techniques to make Xanax pills that are really fentanyl, et cetera, et cetera. So people who are seeking opioids are mostly getting fentanyl. But in addition to that, even people who are seeking non-opioids can often be getting fentanyl. The example I gave of Xanny bars or Xanax pills that are counterfeit pressed into fentanyl but also, as you mentioned, that it might be laced into the cannabis supply or the cocaine supply or et cetera. And so even those that may not be intentionally seeking opiates could be the victim of opiate intoxication, overdose, or tragically death with fentanyl exposure. And so you got to be wary and suspicious of fentanyl, even if the person doesn't say that they're using fentanyl. Sometimes they may be lying, but sometimes they may just not know. That's why availability of fentanyl testing is very important in emergency and treatment settings. And why having Narcan around is super important. When in doubt, somebody's nodding on you, somebody's having trouble breathing, Give Narcan first, ask questions later. It's very low risk to give somebody Narcan and can be life-saving. That's not today's topic, but you all know that. Everybody should have Narcan in their office. All right, dimension two, biomedical conditions and complications. Here again, compared to older adults, this will not be as prominent, as frequent an issue in younger people. They just haven't had as many road miles on them. They haven't been using as long to suffer the bodily medical ravages of the consequences of substance use. In addition, they haven't aged enough to accumulate the kind of chronic medical conditions and aches and pains that I have, that you have, that accrue with getting older. And so those issues are not as prominent. Now, not zero, not zero, and I'll mention some of the more important ones, but they won't be as big a deal as they are in your 50 and 60 year old populations, in the people who've been using for decades. Some of the more important ones though that we will sometimes see, or if we don't see them often, at least we need to be alert for because when we do see them, they are super critical. The first here is often overlooked. So I wanna emphasize injury, traumatic injury from doing something or being a victim or getting into mischief while intoxicated. Oh, that had nothing to do. I just slipped and fell. Yeah, but you had used that day. We want to connect those dots, whether they buy it or they don't. And traumatic injuries in young people are all too common uh, during intoxication, whether it's a motor vehicle crash, 
whether it's slipping and falling, whether it's diving into a swimming pool drunk with water or without water or some other dumb thing. And in the emergency department, they may or may not connect those dots. They may or may not take a drug screen. They may or may not link it to intoxication and make that observation. But we need to do that because if it happened once, it could happen again. And that's a very significant consequence. It also includes being the victim of violence, being beat up, being shot, uh, being in a fight, being sexually assaulted while intoxicated. All of those things are aspects of traumatic injury that intoxication makes more likely. Most of our young people are not injecting, but when they do, opiates, methamphetamine, other things, they are just as subject to the infectious disease consequences of injection use that older people are, soft tissue infections, endocarditis, HIV, HCV, HBV. These are not as common. They are more common in young adults than they are in adolescents, but they do happen and we need to pay attention to them. Seizures are pretty uncommon. We might see them in benzo withdrawal or alcohol withdrawal or in head injuries, but they are very important and need paying attention to. And overdose, I guess, should be higher on this list. Overdoses will be more common, say, than seizures. And opioids, especially, as we just discussed, easy to miscalculate a dose of fentanyl. As you know, fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin. And so even the most experienced user can easily take a bit too much. They may either not know it's fentanyl or they may be pushing the envelope looking for the next level high, but it's very easy uh, to miscalculate. And as I'm sure you know, it is part of the evil, that's my editorial, the evil marketing strategy of drug dealers to kill a few people along the way because it means that their supply is the good stuff. I know that's cynical, but I think it's true. And so this happens um, as you know, uh, collateral damage uh, of the drug trade. And so we need to be cognizant of that. And again, to the point about uh, having Narcan around. Some other biomedical conditions that aren't as dangerous, but do fall into the kinds of things we need to assess for in young people and address. I'm not saying that these are the things that you guys as substance use disorder or behavioral health professionals are going to be doing on day one in your offices, but you want to know about these problems. You want to link people back to or in establishing connection with a primary care provider, think about health needs. And if you can use these as motivational connect the dots kinds of points to a young person, say a young person with asthma who's smoking a lot of cannabis and can't figure out why they're having trouble going up and down stairs or can't play on the sports team or are wheezy in coffee all the time. Well, maybe it's because of the smoking. And would that motivate you to quit or cut down, et cetera? STDs are common. And remember, Patients may or may not know that they have STDs. In girls and especially in boys, STDs can be asymptomatic and silent. So screen testing at the PCP or in the health clinic or the STI clinic is important. Any young person that has a chronic illness, it is likely that substance use can make it worse, if not through a direct biological effect, just by the disorganization of not getting proper care. They're not going to their doctor. They're not taking their medicine for their juvenile onset diabetes, their juvenile arthritis, their sickle cell anemia, et cetera. Contraception and the possibility of pregnancy is very common in this population, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things, although they are not typically life-threatening, although they are not as prominent and severe as they are in older adults, they need to be attended to. Okay. As I told you, it's not going to be as big uh, a focus, but quick break questions, comments, things we want to talk about in dimension two. Please, I have a, a quick question also regarding the overdose. Seems uh, very obvious, but I just want to do that question anyway. Um, is what is it? What is an overdose and what is not an overdose? I mean, 
I have so many cases in which the child report and the family report that they were too much using too much using a lot versus not using a lot versus oh he overdosed yeah or he didn't overdose he was just falling asleep at home what a great question there is no clear bright line that defines how much is too much to the point of overdose obviously in the most extreme if and let's talk about opiates for a second if somebody stops breathing and requires emergency resuscitation by a lay person with narcan by emt in an ambulance in an emergency department in a hospital well that's obvious that's obvious that's the most severe and and clearly uh, that can be catastrophic up to and including death. But what about milder forms in which they almost stop breathing? Or somebody's worried about them at home and has to do something else. Maybe they didn't have Narcan, but they called the ambulance and they wondered, or whether they walk, picked them up and walked them around, or whether they did any of the number of crazy. Uh, kind of myth things that people do, put you in an ice bath, slap you in the head, turn you upside down and shake, you know, you've heard about all these kinds of nutty things that people do. So is that an almost overdose? Is that an overdose? Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a long nod and falling asleep and looking like you're almost in a coma versus being on the point of a lethal overdose. So those are a dimensional, those are a spectrum and we don't really have a good measurement system. But I'll tell you what, anytime somebody is afraid for you, then I'm afraid for you. And you can tell me all you want, ah, it was no big deal. They exaggerated. They overdid it. They're drama queens. I was fine. I just had my eyes closed. I wasn't snoring, you know. Yeah, maybe. But if other people are worried about you, I'm worried about you. And each time you come close, the likelihood that you're going to come close again or come closer or make another miscalculation is worse. And what's our best predictor of overdose, including near fatal and fatal overdose? Our best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, and people who've had an overdose are the ones who are more likely to have another one. So take that seriously. Even if there isn't an absolute bright line, there's no brain scan, there's no blood test. When you ask people about their past history, one of the things you can ask them is, who was worried? What did they describe? What did they have to do? Did they call an ambulance? Did they take you to the hospital? You were in the hospital. Did they admit you upstairs? Did they put a breathing tube in you? Did somebody give you Narcan? You know, you can get into that kind of granular level detail. But for my money, somebody's worried about you. I'm worried about you. I see another hand. Um, quick question. So as a resident in counseling, I am just curious. Um, I know some about substances and, and the effects on the body and things like that. But as a newer to the profession person, I'm curious if you have any specific resources or um, I don't know, agencies or things like that, that you would recommend if I was interested in learning more about substances, their effects on the body, um, you know, how intoxication and withdrawal looks like in them, you know, just looking for further uh, resources for information. That's a great question. Um, I'll tell you briefly, if you're looking for the deep scholarly look, the thousand page textbook, there are several good ones. American Society of Addiction Medicine has one. Oxford Press has one. Um, uh, anyway, there's a bunch of them. Any, any medical school bookstore or on, online, you can look for substance use disorder textbook. That might be more than you bargained for. Uh, SAMHSA, the website, has free series of books on all sorts of substance, all sorts of topics and materials related to substance use disorder. And you can Google treatment improvement protocols, the tips. I forgot what they're up to, but they're like 50 of them. And they're all very good. Some of them are older and maybe need some updating, but they're good basics to start with. 
and they're not super technical and maybe best of all, they're for free. Uh, another place to look is the NIDA website, National Institute on Drug Abuse. Uh, that's a very nice place to start, to begin your exploration. And they have a lot of free uh, educational materials, stuff for professionals, stuff for parents, stuff for kids. So those are some places to start. Thank you. And it's 11.10 and we're at a good pausing point. Next, we'll come back and do dimension three, which compared to dimension one and dimension two is a really big deal for young people. So why don't we take a 10 minute break? So come back at 1120 and everybody go get a stretch, get a cup of coffee and I'll see you in 10. All righty. Everybody back, legs are stretched and let's get started again. So as I said, um, we emphasize dimension four. We mentioned dimension one and dimension two, which will not be as salient and predominant in young people as they are in older adults. And now dimension three, the kind of dual diagnosis or co-occurring dimension, which will have an outsized salience uh, and predominance for young people. These are emotional, behavioral, and cognitive conditions that accompany substance use disorders. And they may be pre-existing or they may be as consequences of substance use. We'll talk a little bit about that, but just to look at prevalence, this graph is the onset of dependence level disorder that's kind of a DSM-4 nomenclature rather than a DSM-5, but either way, for these three different substances, the most common substances of use in young people, cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco, and you can see that the magnitude of the percentage is a little different, but the shape is the same. That is, onset of use, mid-second decade of life, that is the teenage years, peak prevalence, end of second decade of life, beginning of third decade of life, that is young adulthood. And sure, there are plenty of people out here later in the lifespan who have substance use problems, but when did they get started, right? Most of them didn't begin having problems at age 39. We think of substance use disorder broadly as a developmental illness, a developmental disorder of pediatric origin, of pediatric onset. So this is a young person's problem. That's when it gets started. That's when it accelerates to loss of control and persistence for some into adulthood. That's why you're here. That's why we're concerned about it. That's why we want to intervene early, right? Because the earlier you intervene in any chronic disorder, the more likely you are to make a difference before it accelerates, coalesces, congeals, metastasizes into its most malignant form. And then think a little bit about psychiatric disorders, these arrows here. A half of psychiatric disorders have their onset before age 15, and three quarters of psychiatric disorders have their onset before age 24, 25, so the age of vulnerability, the age of beginning, the age of progression overlaps very heavily. Even if the two sets of disorders, substance use, psychiatric mental health disorders, were not intertwined and related, which by the way, you know they are, but even if it was just about chronological coincidence, you wouldn't be surprised that they happen together a lot just because of this timing. And as it turns out, as you know, they are very intertwined. Co-occurrence, comorbidity, co-occurring disorders are the rule rather than the exception. And when we are addressing problems in dimension three, as I mentioned before, we don't necessarily expect a young person to come stamped on their forehead with a neat and tidy diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder. They have messy symptoms 
And those symptoms may add up to a diagnosis, or they may be a mishmash of problems that we call subsyndromal, not actually meeting full criteria for a disorder, but still a significant interference in function. Part of our goal in Dimension 3 is sorting it all out, getting an evaluation, trying to think it through. You think about the greatest hits, if you will, of co-occurring psychiatric disorder. Some of these kids come with 12 diagnoses. They have conduct disorder. They have ADHD. They have depression. They have anxiety. They have PTSD. They have reactive attachment disorder. They have LMNOP. Do they have all of that? Probably not. But they've sometimes been in and out of the system and touched lots of different providers, but super briefly. And so people have thrown out an opinion, but you don't know what to rely on. That's part of the puzzle. Some of these conditions may have had onset from early in childhood. You will not be surprised when you talk to parents to hear them say, oh yeah, my kid has had trouble since they were a toddler. And this particular kid is different than his brothers and sisters. He was the one who was tantruming, who had poor mood regulation, who was impulsive, who was sensation seeking, who was irritable, who had poor social skills or some overlap of many of those things. And those kinds of kids as outliers will be the ones that are more likely to develop substance use. It's not that substance use is not an equal opportunity employer, anybody can get it, but kids that have premorbid mood regulation and other behavioral health difficulties are more vulnerable. And they are the ones who will get in more trouble. Then there are psychiatric symptoms that are directly drug-induced, toxic effects of the substances themselves. But more likely, in that question about chicken and egg, you're not going to know which came first. I mean, sometimes you will, and if you do, that's helpful, but you're not going to know which came first, chicken or egg. And we're going to be thinking about mutually exacerbating sets of disorders. You talk to a kid or you talk to more likely a family. Well, when did he start having trouble with his mood, his behavior? Oh, I don't know, 12 or 13. I see. When did he start getting into substances? Oh, I don't know, 12 or 13, 14. You know, so you're not necessarily going to know. It's all a mishmash. And that's okay. If you don't know, we still want to think about treating them together. We want to think about coordinated or even better integrated treatment. And the old fashioned idea of only treating one set of disorder and then the other in serial fashion rather than parallel and coordinated fashion is outdated and misguided. To cartoon it, right? Maybe in the bad old days, we used to say, I can't treat you for your substance use disorder until you address your psychiatric disorder, come back when you're less psychiatrically ill. Or I can't address your psychiatric illness until you're sober, come back when you figure all that out and then we'll reassess you. Yeah, how many people in either of those circumstances are actually gonna come back? It is a puzzle, it is difficult, but it is our puzzle and we've gotta dig in despite the noise, despite the messiness, despite the difficulty. Hopefully we do better than, again, a Gary Larson view of it. Here's me sitting with a drug-involved teenager, and my diagnosis is just plain nuts. That won't do. Our job is to work to sort it out. That requires making some determination to some extent about what are we compelled to do? What are we likely to do? What is fruitful and safe to do about adding additional mental health and psychiatric treatments to an actively using young person? So a person, say, smoking cannabis with ADHD symptoms, problems in attention, or anxiety symptoms, or problems in irritability and low mood, depressive symptoms. Are we going to wait for them to quit before we start psychotherapy or a medicine? 
Are we going to start a medicine right away or start specialty mental health psychotherapy right away? If any of these things are available, by the way, that may be optimistic of me. And how to sequence it. And there is no gold standard answer. So part of the issue is deciding what are the things that will push you one way or the other. If you're going to emphasize diagnostic precision so that you truly are clear about a diagnosis, sure, you would wait two or three weeks of no use, but will that happen? Are you going to sacrifice precision from missing an opportunity to help a person where you could help both the psychiatric comorbidity and reciprocally the substance use disorder by waiting and insisting on precision. On the other hand, are you going to jump in too soon and risk potential side effects and treatments that may not have been needed by jumping the gun to make a diagnosis that may resolve with reductions or cessation of use? I wish I knew the answer to that question, and we usually don't know in advance. I've made good calls and I've made terrible mistakes both ways in retrospect. So you have to assume a bias. I happen to be a treatment advocate and many of the patients who I see have already had lots of trials of no treatment. So it isn't their first rodeo and I'm jumping in, but some of the factors that can help make a decision about the urgency of the treatment are some of these things that are aspects of the assessment in dimension three. For example, dangerousness lethality. How imminently dangerous does a behavioral, emotional, cognitive symptom, how dangerous is it? How imminent is the problem? Is there suicidal thoughts? Is there risk? Is there dangerousness with assaultiveness? Is somebody likely to be a victim by putting themselves in dangerous circumstances? The more the acuity in this domain, in this subdomain, the more likely we are to risk barreling ahead with making a diagnosis and adding the treatment, even if we're not sure. How much do these symptoms interfere with recovery efforts, with treatment efforts? Somebody's behavior is so chaotic that they won't go to outpatient treatment, that they can't organize themselves to make it, that they're intoxicated or that they're having difficulties with attending in group or those kinds of things such that those symptoms persist and you can't get a foothold in trying to get them to adhere to substance use disorder treatment, reduce their use, quit their use. And so you're thinking, I've got to make some headway with symptom reduction by making a leap and making a presumptive diagnosis. Is their social functioning impaired? What are the common areas of critical social functioning for young people, family, school, work, peer relations, how impaired are those? And the more impaired they are, the less likely you are to get traction without broadening the scope of treatment, ability for self-care, things like activities of daily living, homelessness or near homelessness and housing instability, inability to manage the routines of daily life and progress towards independent living skills, especially concerning young adults. And then the course of illness. Again, the principle of using past behavior to predict future behavior. So for example, some kids who say, we think have a depressive disorder and a substance use disorder, when they use, they become quickly despondent or depressed or fall apart. Or when they become depressed, they quickly relapse and get back into it, knowing that about their past history, knowing what's worked for treatment in the past or what's not, is helpful in terms of predicting 
what you should do in the future, because again, the principle of past behavior predicting future behavior. Just some data to remind you of how intertwined mental health co-occurring problems are with substance use. This looks at major depression, one of the most common of the co-occurring disorders, not the only one, but a very important one, and looks at the likelihood of initiation of substance use, in this case, alcohol or illicit drugs, correlated with whether or not an adolescent had in the past year criteria, met criteria for a major depressive episode. And you can see, excuse me, based on having major depression compared to not having major depression, it confers from twice to three times the risk of initiating. This data doesn't tell us which came first. This doesn't answer the chicken or egg question, but it does show us they are correlated and inextricably intertwined. If kids are depressed, and the same goes for anxious or inattentive or victims of maltreatment and trauma, they are more likely to get into trouble initiating substances. And what about treatment response? That's the initiation story. Here's the treatment response story. This is data about adolescents coming into an acute index episode of high intensity short-term residential treatment. And just looking at the overall information presented, the severity marker here is percent of substance using days. That is what percent of the past three months past 90 days were substance days and coming into residential treatment, they're all very high severity in order to meet criteria for coming into short-term acute inpatient treatment. So they're using most every day, 80, 90% on average. And then they're out of treatment a month later and assessed in the community for follow-up at three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months. And there's a substantial reduction. They've been out of treatment here at three months for a couple of months and they're using much less. You notice that doesn't go to zero. So treatment is effective, but it's not like it's a surgical cure. And over time, there is relapse. They're back in the community in their, among their drug using peers and drug infested communities. They've stopped their continuing care. Uh, and so they resume some of their use on average, but still at a year out, the levels of use are substantially lower than a year ago when they presented for treatment. So again, a nice, picture of the effectiveness of treatment with some of the check mark kind of relapse that you expect. But then divide these populations into two groups. Those in blue with a Beck depressive depression inventory score of greater than 11 versus those in red with a Beck depression inventory score under 11. Higher depressive symptoms, lower depressive symptoms. And those who have higher depressive symptoms at the door are the ones that are less likely to respond as well to treatment and are more likely to relapse and have recurrence of use out in the community. So we saw an example of how depression is related to initiation. Depression is also related to a lower effectiveness of treatment. So you need to pay attention to it and do something in specifically addressing the depression. And what should we do about it? This is data from a famous study, multi-site study led um, by, no, this, I'm sorry, this was a single-site study. She, Dr. Riggs, this is Paula Riggs's work from the University of Colorado. She did a multi-site study that was similar to it in ADHD, but this one happened to be in depression. So this is working with adolescents who have both depression and active substance use. These were moderately severe uh, substance users, so mostly cannabis and alcohol, uh, not as much cocaine, methamphetamine, or uh, heroin. They were actively using, so it wasn't a requirement that they stop using to be treated. And the treatment was an antidepressant fluoxetine, Prozac, versus placebo sugar pill and everybody got substance use disorder counseling. So the questions were, is an antidepressant safe in 
actively using kids. You wouldn't want to give it if it had drug-drug interactions or it caused toxicity when combined with drugs, alcohol, cannabis, et cetera. Is it effective? Does it reduce depression despite active use compared to placebo? And three, does it help substance use disorder outcomes? So question number one, is it safe? Turns out it was safe. You could give this medicine, um, and although every medicine can have side effects, even the Tylenol, the substance use, the active use, alcohol, cannabis, other things, did not increase the risk of the antidepressant. So good news, we can give it and not worry that we're poisoning people. Is it effective? Turns out it was. Lots of people got better over the course of the treatment, but more people got better with the active antidepressant compared to the placebo comparator. Took a while, as you know, antidepressants take several weeks to kick in. So that separation between those that took the active antidepressant fluoxetine Prozac versus those that took the placebo became manifest around week 10 to 12 and then was persistent out to the end of the trial at week 17 and beyond. So that's good news. Active antidepressant helps relieve depression despite active substance use. Now, some of the kids got better on the placebo as well. And why is that? Well, they were getting active psychotherapy and that substance use counseling included material for cognitive behavioral therapy on depression, which we know is another effective way of treating adolescent depression. But more got better when they got both. That is the counseling plus the active antidepressant. So the effectiveness question, check, yes. What about does it improve substance use disorder? And that's the data I'm uh, about to show you. Turns out it did not. So people who got the active fluoxetine did not improve more than people getting placebo in their substance use disorder outcomes, say, how many days were using days. Both groups declined substantially. So the data I'm showing you now is another way of slicing and dicing the outcomes. Rather than comparing active antidepressant to placebo, this slide compares depression responder to depression non-responder. That is, in blue, you're a responder, if your depression got better over the course of the trial. In red, you're a non-responder if your depression did not get better. And the responders, many of them, more of them, were active Prozac takers, but plenty of them were not active Prozac takers, got better from the psychotherapy. But what this shows is that if your depression got better, your days of drug use also improved, your substance use disorder outcomes improved. And if your depression did not get better, your substance use disorder outcomes did not improve. This doesn't tell us chicken or egg which came first. Does substance use disorder outcome improve depression? Does depression improve substance use disorder outcome? The answer to the question, which came first is probably yes, that is, they both reciprocally make each other worse, substance use and depression, and their improvement reciprocally make each other better. But the take home message here is whether your depression gets better through an active antidepressant medication or through psychotherapy, or best of all, both, that's when your substance use is also gonna get better and vice versa, when your substance use gets better, that's when your depression is more likely to get better. We expect these outcomes to go together. This is a ringing endorsement, I think, for an integrated treatment approach. Don't expect one set, the mental health disorder or the substance use disorder, to get substantially better without the other one. Pay attention to both 
concurrently at the same time. Integrated one-stop shop best, but in a coordinated way, if need be, with different providers, but at least who are communicating with each other and sharing goals and sh communicating over the methods and et cetera. Does that make sense? And by the way, she also did a study in ADHD that showed very similar things. But let's take a pause and talk about dimension three co-occurring problems before we move to dimension five. Comments, questions? Yeah, that was my question. If applies for Adderall, um, yeah. so it seems like it's mutually yeah. affecting. Yeah, so let's just talk about that for a second. Um, you know, we sometimes worry that stimulants have street value and that they can be diverted and abused. So that's real. So if a person has a history of misuse or diversion of stimulants, that may not be your first choice. And there are other ADHD pharmacological medica treatments, medications, other than stimulants, so bupropion, atomoxetine, okay. SNRIs, uh, that we often can use instead of stimulants. But I tell you what, I'm less worried. I mean, if a person doesn't have a history, you still monitor it closely. You look at urine screens, you give them short duration supplies, but it's okay to give stimulants if you're thinking you have a diagnosis of ADHD despite active use. But I will say that I'm actually less concerned about the abuse potential and diversion potential, although for sure it does exist and you should monitor and you should be somewhat concerned. What I'm more concerned about is an underappreciation in this population of the side effect profile for stimulants, especially in youngsters who have mood disorders, right? So stimulants can make anxiety worse, can make depression worse, can make insomnia worse. And so you gotta watch out for that. And if they have both, there are very good antidepressants, the bupropions, the SNRIs like venlafaxine and duloxetine, et cetera, that are twofers, if you will, that have dual activity for depression, anxiety, and attention, and are good starting places. But again, as I say, uh, stimulants are okay to try and are often very helpful. Just monitor them closely. Make sense? Yes, and um, what I see in my, in my work, uh, is that many children use Adderall, I mean, and then at the same time, marijuana? Sure. And like... if they're abusing it on the street, then they're probably not good candidates. That's right. But most of them are not, but some are. By the way, you know that these prescription stimulants have a reputation for being smart drugs, right? And students in high school or college say, oh, it helps me get good grades and study better and blah, blah, blah. And couple of things about that. Just because you have a pro-attentional effect of a stimulant doesn't mean you have a diagnosis of ADHD any more than drinking a double espresso means that you have a caffeine deficiency disorder. It's just a common pharmacological response to stimulants, including the mild stimulant caffeine, that we all have an improvement in attention. Doesn't mean we have ADHD or a deficiency. So that's number one. Number two is when you look at the data about non-medical use of prescription stimulants by young people in a student setting, they may say things like, I use it to improve my grades or my academic performance, but the data says they're wrong. The kids that are misusing stimulants are using them, getting them from other people, not with a prescription, non-medical use, actually have worse grades than their counterparts that don't use non-medical prescriptions. And in fact, when you look at their academic behaviors, they are surprisingly skimpy on the usual plain vanilla things that students ought to be doing to try to improve their academic performance. Like how about going to class or doing the homework? And, those kids in comparison to the people who are not using prescription stimulants, I mean, non-medically, are doing less of those behaviors. And thirdly, those people who are using prescription stimulants non-medically also have higher rates of other substance use. So they are the same kids that are into other substances. So their claim that this is all 
for academic purposes is nonsense. They're also the same kids that are drinking and smoking, et cetera, et cetera. Other comments, questions on dimension three. One of the things remember that is so important in creating, and as I've said this before, but I can't say it enough, in creating a dimension three treatment plan is identifying and accessing mental health resources. Maybe your agency has those built in. Maybe you refer to a psychiatrist or a community mental health clinic, but being able to identify resources where kids can get access to diagnostic assessments and both medication and psychotherapy treatments while they're getting concurrent substance use disorder treatment, either in parallel coordinated or one-stop shop, either way. But again, needing to establish those simultaneous concurrent services. But, but questions, comments about dimension three. I have a quick question about um, just like the age range between kids who have like um, substance abuse um, disorders. So on the, on the chart that you showed, it showed that between I think the twenties, like young adults, they have a high peak. Yeah. Um, is that something that like over time, I guess, based on your experience that um, with the right treatments, they're able to just like that, that high risk is able to be reduced. Um, it sounds very like obvious, but like, just like, I think parents sometimes just want like a sense of hope that things could get better. Absolutely. So just in your experience, what, what have you noticed? Because yeah, a lot of we, kids are starting young today. And then absolutely. yeah, around 20s, they're, they're showing a lot of behavioral and all these issues. So we know a lot about this. We know that the earlier you start, the more likely you are to progress to loss of control, development of a disorder, and persistence into adulthood. So the parenting myth of let's get them to learn at home under supervision where they can drink, smoke, vape responsibly is a myth and erroneous. Delaying initiation is prognostically good. Early initiation is prognostically bad. So anything we can do to get kids to not start till they're older, till they're 18, till after they're 21, if they do start to not progress, anything we can do to intervene is better. And one of the things that is another myth is that everybody is doing it. Oh, I'm no different. Everybody's doing it. Why are you bothering me? Well, a lot of people are doing it, but the prevalence data is very clear that it isn't everybody. What percentage of 12th graders? have used cannabis in their lifetime? It's about 50%. Now that's a lot, but it's not everybody. It means 50% of 12th graders have never used cannabis. Only 30% or 25% of 12th graders have used cannabis in the last month. So not everybody has done it ever, and not everybody is doing it currently. What percentage of 12th graders have never, ever in their lifetimes used cannabis, alcohol, or tobacco, or vape? If you ask the kids or their parents, they'll say, oh, everybody's done it by the time they're in 12th grade. Everybody's at least tried. Well, the answer is a lot have, 70% have tried one of those things, but fully 30% have never tried any of those things. So nerds of the world unite, right? One of the things that we want to try to encourage is an identity of non-use. What's your superpower? What's your cloak of invisibility, invincibility that helps motivate you to not get sidetracked? And let's hear the voices of those kids because it isn't everybody. So that's one issue. Earlier initiation, bad prognosis, postponement of initiation, okay prognosis, better prognosis, postponement of progression, better prognosis, 
And the earlier we intervene, the earlier we do something, recognize somebody who's got a problem and get them to assessment and treatment, the quicker they remit, the quicker they get into sustained recovery. So that's the message of optimism. Delay initiation, and as soon as you learn about initiation, we're not gonna cut their heads off, we're gonna debrief them and uh, encourage open honesty and discussion and try to get them evaluation and treatment and treatment is effective. Is, is that responsive to your question? Yes. Um, the other half was just like for people who are already, let's say, at that stage where they started young and they're at that 20 age stage, just again, like what is the percentage or likelihood that um, they could get better? I guess assuming that they would be able to get the right treatments because sometimes they get involved in the law and then they have to, like sure. they're forced at that yeah. point to, to well, get what they yeah, need. This, that's a difficult question to answer because okay. it's a, but I'll, I'm gonna give you a, a rule of thumb anyway. Remember, it's a chronic relapsing remitting illness that goes up and down for many people over the course of the lifespan. And mm -hmm. so like other chronic illnesses, and you can name any number of them that you know about, none of the analogies are perfect, but whether it's diabetes or hypertension or other kinds of, or major depression, kind of chronic waxing waning illnesses that come and go, where we don't have a cure for most people, we don't have a surgery for most people, so we can't say that there's, this is the cure rate, but we can say things like with treatment, 50%-ish of people respond dramatically and a year into treatment have substantially improved their function. Even if they haven't gone into total abstinence, they've substantially reduced their use and reduced their impairment. That's as good as, but better than most other chronic illnesses like hypertension and diabetes. Is there room for improvement? You betcha. But the overall message is one of optimism and encouragement. And the key is engaging people into treatment, not expecting cure, but getting them into care so that they have tools and they can access service delivery treatment to be able to improve their lives and the treatment is effective. Sometimes people have to have several episodes of treatment, right? That's fine. That doesn't mean it's a failure. That means that we are trying to engage them repeatedly and encourage them to keep at it each time, maybe incrementally making a little bit more progress and learning. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. We're getting close to the top of the hour. So my suggestion is let's take some other conversation, questions, discussion, and then we'll do dimensions five and six tomorrow, and then take a deeper dive into our placement case example. But other comments, questions? One, one question is regarding the psychiatric evaluation and the sobriety. Um, when children may continue using, and then you're thinking that the child may need a psychiatric evaluation, but he continues using drugs, and um, it's something that we have to wait until the sobriety is there before moving in that so, direction? I would not, but it's going to depend on the practice style of the psychiatrist. I'm comfortable in integrating both treatments and will say, I think you have depression, ADHD, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to suggest that you both do this substance use treatment with me and you do this psychiatric treatment with me and go to counseling and see a therapist and maybe take a medicine all at once. And I will be risking that maybe I'm giving you a medicine that you might not have needed if I could have gotten you instantly into sobriety, which is beyond my power. So I'm going to try both things and take that risk. There may be other psychiatrists who won't want to do that. 
And part of it is understanding what the practice style is of your collaborators and colleagues. But I will say that I would encourage people to try to get a history. One of the ways you get it, you try to inform this decision is, is there a family history, right? The, the stronger the family history, the more likely it is to be a treatable psychiatric disorder in addition to the substance use disorder. To look back in the history to periods of abstinence or reductions in use in the past. So did you quit for the summer when you were staying with your grandmother in Florida or North Carolina? Or did you quit for a month when you were in juvenile detention? Or did you quit for six weeks or cut down for six weeks when you were going to football practice and the coach was on your case? Or whatever it is, was there a time where you did reduce your use or you cut out your use? And what happened to psychiatric symptoms then? If they magically melted away, oh, well, that teaches us something. But if they didn't and they persisted, that teaches us something else that maybe we should be treating it in addition with a medicine or with psychotherapy or with both. Again, this is not precise. There is no blood test. There is no brain scan. And what this means is you've got to be prepared to revise your hypothesis. I'm under treating, I'm over treating. Let's change the hypothesis and try something different. But my practice style is presumably to be over aggressive and to understand that I might be jumping the gun, but these patients have already had lots of time with no treatment. And the risks of many of our psychiatric medicines are relatively low. The antidepressants, for example. Now the antipsychotics are a different story. Don't use the benzos, reluctant as I say to use the stimulants, but do use them. But again, for what is a very prevalent set of co-occurring disorders with anxiety and depression, the risks of using antidepressants, which can be very effective, those risks are relatively low. So I'm relatively quick to start people with symptoms on those medicines. Now, if I make no progress with them reducing their use at some point, I might say, huh, I'm not really helping you much, am I? Your depression's not getting better. Your substance use isn't getting better. Let's try something different. But I'm eager for an opportunity to give it a try. Is that helpful? Thank you. Thank you, yes. Yeah. Last couple of minutes. Any one, one or two more questions and then we'll break till tomorrow. Going once, going twice. Okie doke. So then tomorrow at 10, same bat time, same bat channel. That's exactly right. And you will use the link that you used today to access the training. It is the same link. Um, for those of you who caught my error with the eval, you will see that I have now posted the one that says Tuesday. For those of you who didn't know if it was Tuesday or Wednesday, that's okay. Um, so please go ahead and fill out the evaluation. Um, we will see you tomorrow. If you are on my list of you are not properly registered, that would be Amaryllis Galoza, Tanesha F, Shannon Bennett, Prince Matthew, which is a county, so I'm pretty sure there's a name behind that, Nicole Bassingthwaite, Latonia Levister, Greg Huff, and Brittany Clear. Um, Please email me at edensley at vt.edu because you are not properly registered for this class. You are welcome to attend, but you will not get um, CMEs for it. Um, so you need to be registered. So send me an email and we'll try to get you fixed up. Um, I think that's all I have. So you are welcome to move about the country freely. <laughs> Fasten your seatbelts. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Thank you.